This is Tony with Grow Sessions. How's everybody doing today? I've got my good friend, Matt O'Boyle from Valera Architects. Matt, how's it going? It's going pretty well. Can't complain. It's a nice day out. Keep them busy. Absolutely. Yeah, this, this industry, it's always a little, it's always busy for us. It doesn't matter the time of year. I feel it's like ups and downs and it's good stuff. But uh, yeah, we've had some calls. You know, we've been chatting a little bit about different projects and different areas that we're working on. But why don't you uh, just jump right in and tell us like, tell us a little bit about Valeri and where you guys started and how you got into the cannabis world. Sure. So I've been working in the cannabis industry for probably about seven years now. Uh, I got into it from a just kind of cold call at a firm that I was working on down in uh, Connecticut. Worked in the industry about three years and then kind of made a name for myself in the Northeast, connected with a lot of people out here, saw the value of an architect that knows cannabis, uh, seeing that it's a, it's a unique industry. It's got some similarities to others, but it's kind of a mix up of many different industries and uh, really helps to have an architect that understands the industry when it comes to designing a dispensary, a cultivation facility, what have you. And so I kind of took that network and expertise and started Valir about uh, three years ago now. Does Valir stand for anything specific or is it just a combination or is that someone's name? Yeah. So it's actually the uh, root word in Latin for values, kind of ethical and professional values. Uh, I kind of went back and forth a lot on the name when we were first starting up. And I knew from the beginning that I wanted Valir to be bigger than just me. So I didn't want to name it after myself. And we have a high value of ethics uh, me and my partner, Jim, and we felt that that really kind of fit our ethos really well. Uh, and so we just kind of ran with that. Nice. That's awesome. I know we talked about a bunch of different topics um, when we had in our pre-calls, but I was just curious, like I wanted to kind of just bring up some that we kind of agreed upon. Um, we were talking about optimizing space utilization in cultivation and design of, of, a, of a facility. I mean, can you elaborate, elaborate on that a little bit? Like how do you approach the space utilization you know, in cannabis facilities? So they, they maximize it and they're maximizing their yield. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when it comes to talking about efficiently utilizing a space, there's two very broad topics that are separate. It's new construction versus existing. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a new construction facility, you know, in my opinion, kind of the flow of that and the process of how to, how to manage a facility that's new. It's kind of a solved problem. You know, we have, the, we have this kind of seed to sale idea that we bring into a facility design where you have a receiving area where all products and things come in and then an exterior delivery area where everything comes out and the product kind of flows naturally through a facility. When you're doing something new, it's pretty easy to make that work. The value that we bring is more in the existing conditions where you're dealing with a building where you have existing constraints and understanding kind of how the flow of an existing building might affect the proposed design. Uh, that's something that we specialize in, especially in Massachusetts. We have a lot of old building stock up here. Yeah. A lot of old mills and stuff. Exactly. And they're huge too, right? So oh, yeah. But they weren't designed for the, the cannabis. So you have columns and you're trying to put in a four foot wide table and making sure that they can move and corridor spacing and everything. And that's where our expertise comes in and understanding the particulars of how you want to grow and how that changes your space and your layout of your facility. Do you go out to the facility uh, like as a prerequisite, like as you start talking with someone and they agree to use your services, do you go out and kind of either you or your partner, Jim, or one of the people from your team does like a site survey? Because a lot of things... I know that with us too, like we will go out and like, well, I walk a lot of facilities, even though we do the lighting portion of it. Like I kind of want to see where they're thinking of hanging it, what they're doing. And all of a sudden you're like, this isn't what you told me on the phone. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, irresponsible not to, as an architect, you know, we yeah. have a certain level of standards that we, we bring to the table and to design a facility without seeing the existing conditions is, is not a great idea. Uh, it's actually something that we've dealt with a lot when we get, kind of an SD package from a land use application or what's kind an of SD screen. package just to, if someone doesn't know what that means yeah so that's a schematic design so that's kind okay. of the first pass of layouts when you're really kind of fiddling with the different ways to approach kind of the puzzle of an existing building and uh if you don't know the existing facility the the space that you're going into you can run into all kinds of impacts to both budget schedule feasibility, even if it's yep. possible to do this without really investigating the existing conditions. Do you guys look at things like, um, I notice these things just because we're always looking for where the power is coming in and the water's coming in and going out. So I'm sure you guys look at that as well, like, because the power might, if this building is a hundred yards long or 
whatever 200 yards long and they want they actually want the power and all this services at the other end like you might have to flip-flop like i i you mentioned to them like no this is the way our workflow goes i'm like sometimes you have to look at the building like you were saying and be like well to run that amount of to move all this electrical service move all this plumbing to the other end it's it's not it's cost prohibitive yeah exactly and that's where our you know expertise as a cannabis architect comes in where we know that there are certain demands of these facilities that another architect may not kind of factor into those schematic plans. Uh, it's also why typically we'll carry the MEP engineering and any consultants professionally that we need to get the project done so we can manage all the different trades and all the different pieces that come in to fill this puzzle. And uh, it's, you know, it's worked out pretty well so far. We've helped a few clients avoid some very expensive pitfalls. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. What are you thinking? I mean, I know we're just touching on that, but what do you think are some of the common mistakes you see like in designing of like a, just a general, I mean, all architects have their specialties, but I feel like the ones that are just jumping in, you know, like I, I talked to a lot of folks and someone's like, I've got a buddy that's an architect. I'm like, cannabis architect? They're like, no, I'm like, well, you should probably look at a cannabis architect. What do you see with like some of the common mistakes in design in some of these facilities? Yeah. So, I mean, common mistakes, I would say not understanding the the process of a plant through the facility and how that affects yep. how you, you know, you don't want your employees walking across the building to go get your clones, come all the way back to fill a room. You know, you want kind of a sequential order of operations, um, but also just the sizing of rooms. So we have a pretty industry standard sizing of tables and aisle widths and things like that. So you can find plans that the, the width of the room is an awkward size and it just kind of ends up wasting space. If you have a large facility that could end up being, you know, several rows of tables that are wasted in these in these rooms. And that's revenue. That's that's operating income for you that you're just leaving on the table, so to speak. Yep. Um, we also run into a lot of issues where we have designs that come to us where the materials and methods aren't great. You know, they're they're using fiberglass, bad insulation, and gypsum wallboard to create and a wood studs. You know, it's just because it was cost cutting. You no, know, no mold issues possible. there. Exactly, and it's you know <laughs> that that's kind of gone by the wayside. We see that less and less now, but it still pops up every now and then. We're just like, no, you don't you don't want to do that. That's a bad idea. Yeah, I mean it's it's hard though because people do have it in their mind and as they've gone from like a small home grower in some tents and then they kind of scaled up to maybe they went to a caregiver model. It's like a two car garage. And now mm -hmm. they're stepping into the big boy game and it's, it's a whole nother, it's a, that's just a lot going on. And, you know, and you're trying to explain that to some folks and it's a lot of undertaking too, of just like the, the manpower that goes into these facilities that how many people like you're building a large scale facility, you know, that you can't do this on your own. Yeah, it's absolutely. different. Like you just can't, but, um, um, can you share some of the innovative design solutions that you guys have implemented to like save like the space efficiency in your projects? Sure. So, you know, when it comes to architecture, it's, it's not so much innovation as it is iteration. We're kind of developing the best practices every year. It gets better. You know, we come up with different ways to solve problems. We come up with different methods to approach issues. Um, one of the kind of creative things that we've done that would be um, impressive was a facility that we worked on in Connecticut where phase one of the project was accelerated to create a grow space for seedlings because it was so new to market that there wasn't available plant stock to buy to fill a, a cultivation facility if you just turn it on. So we fast-tracked a section of the building to get seedlings in while then average those were growing into clones and mother plants and it's getting that kind of uh, base going, the rest of the facility was gonna be constructed and, and built out and, and ready to go as soon as those plants were ready to be transferred. So that saved, you know, six months of potential downtime for this facility waiting. You know, if you, if you turn on a 50,000 square foot facility and then you put seedlings in. You gotta fill it. Yeah, you gotta fill it. It takes some time to start from scratch like that. Well, we find that a lot. And I think each state has some different rulings. I know like some places like we'll call it the state turns their head a little bit. You know, they say, all right, you're allowed to bring in, you know, X amount. You know, they some of them want you to pop it from seed. I've seen that. Then other ones are like, you're all right, you're not allowed to bring in your moms. And other ones are like you can bring in a one time veg dump. And they're thinking they're just gonna bring in some veg plants where people are like bringing it in. I've seen customers actually that have brought in like they are closing down their one grow, they converted it all to a veg. So they mommed it all up. Mm -hmm. They cut all their clones, they vegged it, and then when they're, all these rooms are they've been tested and fired up, like air conditioning is working right, DQ's on, lighting's working. They just like the the state's like, what day are you bringing in? They're like Friday, and they fill seven production rooms <laughs> for for twenty thousand square feet of product in one day. They're like they brought in everybody they know, in the in the we'll call it the CCC, whatever the cannabis governing board's like, okay, 
you're up and running <laughs> like it's good so uh, I'm, I'm seeing that happen a little bit too now which is kind of funny yeah those first flush stocks are those are always impressive to see it go from empty to full in, in a day or two those oh it's it's nuts but i mean it's weird though that some people aren't planning that out too they're thinking that okay because like it's not now's not the time to pheno hunt when you're building these facilities so like this is the time to like okay do i have some mom stocks that i can cut my clones and have it cloned for two to three weeks and i vegging it for another two to three weeks and get it going um is there a specific project that you were thinking of is that the one in connecticut that you're saying that like you they you guys design it that way yeah exactly yeah that's cool where do you find where most are your projects are you mostly northeast are you guys adventuring out west or uh, most of our projects are Northeast. Yeah, we're doing a lot of work in New Jersey right now. That seems to be sure. the hot point. Um, we're looking at a lot of Kentucky medical applications. We've done a couple dozen of those. So oh, cool. Looking at a couple dozen. We've applied for, I think, eight of them so far, and we're working on the rest. Uh, we're looking at Ohio as well. Uh, yeah. We've done projects as far as Nevada, and I've looked at some in California. So oh, we've... that's awesome, man. That's good. So you guys have good reach. Um, yeah. yeah, I know Minnesota. I'm, I'm shooting up to Minnesota. Um, there's been some buzz up there too. So that's definitely, I think, going to be a good one. Um, when you're talking about like scalability and like future proofing your facility, what design elements do you guys consider essential for ensuring the, the facility can scale up and operate as demand grows? Sure. This kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about the there's kind of two beasts there's the pre the existing facilities and then there's new construction. So again, with new construction, you can you can design your layout to have corridors that can be extended. You can do kind of a pod idea where the next phase is another 20,000 square feet with its own dedicated dry and trim and cure and things like that. Those are pretty straightforward to put together. Um, more so, it comes down to existing buildings. And if you're trying to phase a project, how do you divide up a 100,000 square foot warehouse to make sense? Because you're not... You're not dealing with the same thing. You don't want to go trenching new new drains into your existing space. You don't want to kind of put new plumbing in for fertigation or toilets or things like that. Uh, you don't necessarily want to have kind of a, a really long travel time for grow rooms and things. So it really, it, it takes a comprehensive evaluation of the existing building. That's something that we offer and that's something that we, we do a lot for all of our projects and understanding the goals of the client. Um, so a project that we did in Hardwick, Massachusetts is a 85,000 square foot scope of work across four floors. And we were talking to the client cool. about you know, how are we going to phase this? How are we going to make this work? Uh, decided to do each phase at each floor of the building, which is about 20,000 square feet. But that included some kind of prepping for the future phases. So, you know, making sure that we we're future proofing for the, the later expansions. So we put a new stair tower in, we put new risers in, we put fertigation risers that went all the way up to prep for the future phases that it can just be tapped into. So we're not impacting our existing facility. So when you do an addition, you know, you have a huge capital expense, but you don't want to interfere with your operating revenue. So you want to make sure that your facility is 100% operational while you're doing this work. So that, that really becomes the focus on how to separate these things and how to make sure that you can expand without impacting your current operation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I see that a lot. Um, as people are planning it, you know, this is phase one, phase two, phase three, or how are they going to scale it? But they definitely need to put in some, they need to have the backbones in now because it's easier to, like, if, like you say, if you had your trench drains already cut in, or if you had already pulled some, even if you didn't pull all the power, but you had all the conduit underneath the concrete that you could pull all your wiring through, you know, there's some things that can be done ahead of time. And it's a small expense now to, saving a ton of money down the line because we're, we're we talk about that all the time with folks like where are you centrally putting certain things because like we were saying before like if the power is at one end of the building and then you expand you know you build out half of this place and then you're going to expand the rest of the way you still got to run all that wire is it make sense now to move that power to be more central or that plumbing in line or those irrigation skids and, and you know water storage tanks and you're dry are you going to be using the same dry cure and you're going to be expanding that so everything's funneling to the center so there's a lot of things as we're chatting with people like identifying because you we've seen a lot of I don't want to say they're poorly designed but they're definitely not as efficient as it could be. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, you know, like the, you tapped on electrical but also mechanical, you know, as a, a big enough facility where you want a central plant that can be expanded. You know, yeah. these these are big ticket items that you really want to make sure you're thinking about and being very realistic about also making sure that it fits your needs, not just the, the future needs it needs to fit your needs now it needs to make sure that it works for you as soon as you turn on 
do you see I'm, I'm it just just came up recently i mean not super off talking but when you were talking about power and like you know like cogen units do you see more people designing that into the facility not necessarily to have it at the present hand but have the pads already poured and have the hookups outside so if god forbid you know we lose power we kind of do get some hurricanes up here or even in the winter you could get a blizzard bad storm and like they want to be able to because i was out of a facility recently he's like well these are the pads and i was like wow this is great and like these people are actually starting to think instead of this well i can't afford it i can't put whatever is it a million bucks i don't know what the number is but uh they're like okay we have the pad and if we have to rent it or it's part of our insurance we can actually pay this person monthly and we will be the first on the list where they drop off two tractor trailers that are like power um uh, i call it cogen units and they just hook up to our building they're ready to go yeah, I haven't really seen too much in terms of emergency power, but um, there's some companies doing some creative things with financing and, and different payment structures and, and ways to make these cogen units more cost effective for your initial capital expense. Yeah. In the long run, they're, they're pretty much always a great investment for operating expense. You know, they pay themselves off eventually, but they're a huge upfront cost. Um, but we found in New Jersey, there are a few people that we're talking to that are investigating that or, or even pursuing that actively as a way to circumvent the current uh, transformer shortages and, and the costs involved with upgrading the transformers. So they're just yep. doing cogen. There's enough natural gas on site that they just connect right to that. And then they just generate all of their power from the start themselves. And they don't need to wait for certain gear to come in. Uh, that's, you know, not only has a greatly increased in cost, but, you know, looking at a one year lead time versus a cogen that can be dropped on, you know, in two weeks. Yeah. There's, there's some cogen units. I mean, they they do build some of them to, suit but i mean yeah there's some pretty big machines out there that they can get on property and there's definitely some i mean again i'm not an accountant but i mean there's definitely some cool tax benefits and some creative marketing and not marketing um funding for those too that like these these power supply companies doing it um what do you see like for like as you're designing facilities like future proofing like some of the stuff for like future technologies and like if there's certain advancements in it is there is a way to I mean, you don't know what's coming down the line, but is there a way to kind of prepare for some of that? So architecturally speaking, um, what we typically try to do, and this is something we've learned over the years designing, especially larger cultivation facilities, is not to use up every square inch of your facility on your first design. You want to leave some space. You're going to adjust. You're going to adapt. Things are going to kind of change. You know, you might alter the way you grow. You might alter the way you fertilize. Like you said, there might just be a lighting change, all these different kind of adaptations. Sometimes you just need some space. Mm -hmm. so we found that early on, we designed and built a few cultivation facilities that then there were no flex spaces. There was no additional room for fertigation. It was all kind of designed as tightly as possible to maximize cultivation space, but it limited their future scalability. It limited adaptation. They, they couldn't change from one batch tank to four because they wanted to alter their, their um, fertigation based on the stage of the plant. Instead of having one uh, fertilizer, they wanted four different stages and they couldn't do it because we didn't provide the floor space for that because that wasn't part of the original design. So we had to go in and make some modifications to the existing facility that was impactful to their, you know, their operating. So that, that kind of affected them for a while. So things like that are, are kind of the, the biggest things for us. It's really about giving yourself some space. Don't over yeah. I think that's super important. I, I mean, it's, we stress that a lot on our calls with folks where like, it's okay to scale. It's okay to start small, relatively small. And some people, you know, they want to capitalize on that new market and that new adult use money and the high value dollar per pound, because they want to capitalize on that money before it gets kind of levels out, you know, like different States, it's just leveled out. And I totally understand that, but you still, you know, <laughs> to, dumb it down i'm like you're still gonna be a farmer now you're only inside growing a cool product but you're still a farmer like are you ready for long farmer days and being like hands-on all the time and uh it's funny like how many people are like well i'm gonna pay someone to do that like, well that's awesome but you still got to know how to do it you have to have that passion yeah you have to have the passion for the facility and and for the for the plant and like what's the story and what's your what you're doing with it. Do you guys help with them like too, or do you have uh, like, do like some of the marketing for them too, or do you help any, with any aspects of that? Because I feel like a lot of them aren't even, they're not even getting themselves out there well enough. Yeah. I think for us, it's mostly a networking thing. So we have yeah. a lot of contacts in the industry. You know, we have a ton of dispensary clients. We have a ton, ton of cultivation clients. There's ones that are vertical. 
Um, we've made connections with cultivators to our, our retail clients and just kind of yep. making connections and letting them go from there. Um, you know, we have licensing experts. If our clients need licensing help, we, we've kind of seen it all and, and we know who to trust in the industry because, you know, it's, it's, it's gotten better over the years, but essentially early on, it was, it was a lot of snake oil, a lot of kind of people taking advantage. Um, so we built some trusted relationships based on doing actual projects together. And you mm -hmm. can pretty easily tell if someone knows what they're doing just by working with them on a project. Yeah, we, we say we see that quite a bit too. There's there's still some people, there's still some sneaky people and they're trying to talk and, you know, they're the smartest person in the room. And if you're not sure about it, just ask them because I'll tell you, and because you sit there and again, we don't know everything, but boy, you've done, we've done a couple hundred projects across the U.S. and internationally and we've done a fair amount and we kind of, we've seen a lot of mistakes as well as some great successes, but also to something that you thought would be super successful. You're like, well, God damn, like that didn't go as planned, you know, and it, nothing to do with us, but it just sometimes some things just people aren't, they're thinking it's going to go perfect. And I feel a lot of times stuff you're trying to, it's risk mitigation. It's like how yeah. many, how many wrongs can we try to avoid? Cause stuff's going to go wrong. Absolutely. But, uh, it's insane. Uh, easy task. Oh my God. Um, How do you see our architecture? Um, How is the impact on the capital expense and long-term operating expense? How important is that? So this, this is actually a huge topic. That's something that I try to educate a lot of my clients on. So many of our clients have never done a construction project. They've mm -hmm. never hired an architect. They've never worked with a GC. They've never gone out to get bids on a set of drawings to, to evaluate and level bids to make sure they're getting the best price. Uh, so they don't really understand necessarily that architecture is more than just a set of permit drawings that allow you to build. It's more than just a design of a dispensary, you know, there's decision making at the most minute levels that we make based on our experience and, and knowing what the, the client's goals are that have a huge impact of budget, um, not just from a design point, but also like evaluating, going back to evaluating existing facility, understanding where the pain points of an existing building are, you know, where the floors are really bad, where it's going to cost you some extra money to fix things that you can maybe avoid, move that to phase two when you're, you've got some revenue. Um, we had a client in Connecticut that had a layout of a facility. It was, it was a good layout, but they didn't take into account the existing condition of the floor. And there was a section of this facility. It was an old manufacturing facility that had concrete curbs and, and depressions and all kinds of modifications. It wasn't just a flat concrete floor. And there was such a large area that could have been moved to phase two that they included in phase one just because the, the layout worked really well. But that was looking like a four to five hundred thousand dollar floor repair just to get this back to to level to put tables on. So the floor did it did it sink or was it just all different levels of floor? And there were there were pits, there were ramps, there were raised concrete plinths, and you know to to demolish and fill in concrete like that of a it was a large large area, it cost a lot of money, and yeah. so it just wasn't something that they were aware of because again they were just looking at kind of a floor plan, some basic photos, but they didn't understand the impacts and the construction costs. Uh, we've had this, we've done a, existing building evaluations for clients looking to purchase buildings. And we're like, you know, there's not enough power. Like we, we had a building uh, in Attleboro where the city lines weren't even big enough to bring in the 8,000 amps they wanted facility. And it was going to cost tens of millions of dollars to run new lines. Ooh, from the right. And nobody told them about this. They were about to enter into a contract. They're about to, you know, put in a, an offer on this building. And then they just wouldn't have been able to develop their project. So it's, it's things like this that, again, from an experienced architect that knows cannabis, knows your needs, kind of understands what your end goal is and how to get there, that's where our value comes in. And we can save you a tremendous amount of money as long as we know what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's super important. Like, there's so many different little angles. that, And I feel that there's a, a good... The industry, like you said, it's starting to shake out. There's a lot less snake oil people and it's starting to shake out where there's a lot of people that we're looking out for these customers because they're spending a lot of their hard-earned money. And some of it's like family money and like they're, they're, they're putting it all on the line to make sure they're su successful. And if they're successful, we're all successful. If they fail, like no one wins. Like in the end of the day, like no one wins when it's, when it's not a successful launch of a, of a project and where, where you're seeing them. How are you seeing like the, uh, the money lending situation going for like for kind of facilities is, do you see money loosening up or are you still seeing it pretty tight? Uh, well, so we've worked with a lot of uh, lenders that are kind of private equity lenders. 
and sure. uh, so we didn't really saw a slowdown with uh, referrals that we make for for lending. There was definitely a slowdown as a whole, uh, like a, a couple of bank acquisitions and some adjustments and tightening. But I think it's starting to loosen up now. We're starting to see more inquiries on cultivation facilities, especially in New Jersey. Yeah, also because the the dispensary market there is maturing now, so people are seeing the demand for the flower. So cultivation is becoming more of a demand. Uh, and then I would expect uh, manufacturing to be right behind that. So that was similar in Massachusetts where dispensaries went up, cultivation went up, and then people were like, oh, we need to be able to manufacture things. And so some people came in, were a little early adopters to large manufacturing facilities and done very well for themselves. So we're, we're anticipating a similar uh, path in New Jersey. What do you think about like the stuff that's going on right now too with, I see it, but I, I think it's written into some of the bylaws, like New York, New Jersey. I think it's in Pennsylvania. There's these delivery licenses and it's not delivering to the end user. Maybe it is, but it's, there's supposed to be the, like this middleman that like, it's the distributor. Like, so hi, I'm the grower. I sell to the distributor and then the retailer, but there's this person that's supposed to do it, but no one's really doing that right now. At least I don't see too much of it. Do you see that like happening right now in different states or is it, it's kind of just one of those I don't want to say weird, just like an odd. Yeah, thing. it's it's unique. There's a lot of people with passion for the plant in the industry, and they come like come, delivery isn't this kind of interesting, sexy thing to do. It's they're just moving product, but there's value to it, and there's there's requirements for it from the state. And there's a lot of regulations. Uh, we've done a handful of them in uh, Massachusetts. We actually yeah. did a zip run out of Boston, which was one of the first in Boston to open. And uh, we did Budsy out in Western Mass, which was the first in the state to become an operational delivery service, uh, both for direct to client or customer and, and business to business. So again, they, they've they been successful. I uh, don't really know too much about their business model, but um, there's definitely a niche there and it's, it's a need. So somebody has to fill it. Yeah, I think it's pretty, it's, it is pretty unique for some of those things that are going on but well this has been awesome man i i'm i love having you on having you on a podcast i mean how what's the easiest way for people to get a hold of you sure so we have a website bleararchitects.com and that has all our contact information we have an online form there uh, we have a few splash pages depending on the state if you google us you'll find us in your state if you're going uh retail or even medical legal um just uh, find my contact information shoot us an email and we'll set up a call set up a call and you have to do a nice introductory call kind of learn about the customer and see what they're looking to accomplish because it seems like some of them start to hire some people that will do a drawing or they go to like a a leave like a gross store and they give them some drawings that are just not really that aren't yeah. great yeah we, <laughs> yeah we definitely try to emphasize the fact to hire, hire a licensed professional you know we are we are licensed architects we are able to give you the drawings that you need to actually get it built uh, but we also know how to do cultivation facilities so we're not just you know a regular architect do you um, go to a lot of the town meetings with people too? Like if people yeah, need that or if they require that service for you to go and talk to, hey, this is my order mitigation plan. This is my whatever. Yeah. So pretty much every state that I've worked in so far, there is a land use or a special permit application process that we've yeah. gone uh, for existing locations, especially dispensaries. A lot of times we're able to avoid the need of a civil engineer, even if the application requirements said you need them. I can stamp site plans and write affidavits and things to basically say that, you know, it's existing. These processes aren't in place for existing buildings. They're meant for new construction, uh, but the cannabis legalities kind of push them there just for additional review and control over these applications. So we've been able to successfully get through without civil engineering, new projects, you need a civil engineer, but even then we've done a lot of meetings with the civil engineer because they will present the building, the site, all the modifications, et cetera. But the board, the town, if it's a planning board or a zoning board or what have you, they always have cannabis specific questions. And usually that falls on to me as the more experienced professional in cannabis to answer and make them comfortable. And uh, I think we've done, or I've personally done over over a hundred of these land use applications and I've only been denied once. So. Oh, wow. That's good. That's actually really good to know. Because yeah, you kind of hear this, people are waiting for either some sort of town approval or they're waiting for special permit or they're waiting for special use and they're paying money on rent sometimes and they are investing in these buildings and you're like jesus like i it's so hard it's it is heartbreaking like a lot of stuff that's going on in new york like i, I was I'm not picking on new york but boy it's just been kind of a crappy situation for the last two or three years and not saying jersey did it perfect i'm just right. saying jersey did they they launched the program and it actually 
I think it's pretty successful. And the same time, New York got approvals within months, and they launched the program. And it seems to be nothing but disaster. <laughs> it's too bad. I mean, I think it's a I think it's a great market. It will be at least. It will. It will be. They'll they'll figure it out. There's there's a lot of hurry up and wait in the industry, and that that's at all levels of a project. It's a lot of hurry up and wait. Yeah. So, and then we've gotten used to our contracts for our services. I, I like to give a complete comprehensive start to finish proposal, no matter what we're doing, just so you can see how much effort this is going to take me after we get through this initial stage, but our contracts can be paused at any time. So we'll do the first two phases of a project and that's suitable for these special permit land use applications. And you can just pause there and wait the months that it's going to take to get through that process and then pick up the contract in the future. But I don't like giving you a number for that. And then, you know, the, the, the fee for the rest of the project is, is significantly higher than the first phases of the, fee, the project, because that's where the real meat and potatoes is for us in our work. Uh, so I don't want like a sticker shock. I like to be very transparent. Yeah. So they know what they know what to get into. Exactly. Which is huge. Well, and I, I said before, this is great to have you on here. Anybody want to reach out, Villar Architects, they can reach out to Matthew over here and he'll help you out. Him and his team will jump right on that forum and you can guys can set up a call and, and uh well hopefully we'll see you at the next show great appreciate it thanks for having me it was awesome, great man. Talk shop. i love it i love it i can't wait can't wait to hang out again this is great take care thanks man